questions. So I have no problem with um, stopping at any point and, and answering whatever you would like. There is no quiz, you just get your credits. So whatever we cover, we cover. And that is, you know, I, I much prefer to see you and kind of read the audience, but Ashley will do that um, for me and, and don't hesitate to ask. So we know this, we're all tree people and, and uh, we know that trees are good for people and that they are very important to our, our standard of living, um, not only because that they're environmentally uh, critical to um, air, stormwater management, um, heating and cooling as a, a biogenic utility, they uh, reduce stress and disease in people. This is, this is a di well-documented fact. Um, and also, of course, our amenities and that they, that they provide wildlife and, and, you know, they're beautiful. But we have to remember that tree, there is tree risk. So all, with all those benefits of trees, there are also risks. So it's unavoidable. There is you know, no way <laughs> that whatever goes up is gonna come down eventually. And of course our job is to prevent um, this natural occurrence from impacting people and things that people care about. So um, when people, I love it, they say, well, can you make my tree safe? No, well, yes, I, yes, I can if I remove it and the stump, but there is no way to, to be completely safe if there is a, uh, you know, something up in the air. So uh, our job is to um, sort of qu not quantify, but qualify the risk. Is this a risky tree? Well, we can see it has a defect it's in, in, and it is, it is in the process of failing. However, it's not risky unless it's gonna hurt something or, or somebody. So this idea of target, and what a tree can hurt is, is um, something I think we, over, we tend to overlook. And not only is there a target, but what level of um, chance is there that the defect is gonna impact the target? So of course we're, we're, in, we're assessing trees constantly for risk as we just go about our job, whether you're a, you know, a climber before you're entering the tree, if you're working underneath a tree, um, and then wherever people are congregating or the buildings and, and amenities that are near the trees. And of course, when we're assessing storm damage. So this is just a regular part of our world and I, I know you're all familiar with it. So let's look at it a little more technically. So um, tree used to be hazard tree. Of course, I was using the ISA guide um, there on the left. I guess it would be, yeah, I think it would be your left as well. The red one um, from the beginning and that was it was a very nice way um, to really systematically look at trees which which is of course very important that we're looking at everything and then there's always this complicated thing about how to quantify it, which ones are the worst trees so um, Ed Hayes wrote the one at the top for the DNR it's a it's it's a little more simple um, a little more straightforward, which you would imagine when they're managing campground trees or trees that are um, on walking paths and picnic areas and things like that. And then even Bartlett, you know, had a, a good publication, but today, oh, this is, well, and I should say, this is that uh, tree hazard evaluation form that came out, oh my gosh, in the eighties, I guess. And it gives you an idea. I know you can't, <clears throat> or possibly you can on your desktop because it's a lot better than a screen, but, um, it just it shows the systematic approach to you know assessing a tree for for health and hazard. But now we have a BMP or best management practice uh, Nancy standard for tree risk assessment, and this is uh, the track qualification, which is the tree risk assessment qualification that they now have is is linked to this or. Um, hooked to, I get, I get, I don't know if it's hooked to technically, but it is, it definitely represents the material in the um, BMP. And this is the new edition of it. We just are now um, at ISA Michigan attempting to put on tree risk assessment qualification. I believe there was like, I don't know, 30 people signed up for it, had to cancel it due to the COVID issues right now. However, it'll be up and running, you know, as, as soon as possible. Um, so yes, I'm track qualified, have been for, I don't know, years. So in their BMP and in the track qualification, they're gonna define tree risk assessment as the risk 
is the probability of something failing and its consequences. So um, that that is that is that, yeah. So those are the basic elements we're going to break down. Um, but also know that there's different levels of assessment. So the limited visual, which is level one, is for instance, if you're let's say you're a, a city forester and you've got a population of trees and you just want to know, my gosh, we just had a big windstorm, did we not? Or maybe this heavy snowfall that we had yesterday. Um, you want to go and uh, drive by and see the tree just from the car. And that is a great way to do a very quick assessment on anything major that's going on. So uh, big hangers or uh, stuff actually on the ground or uh, um, cracking or something serious that, that needs to be dealt with right away. The basic level of assessment is what most of us do, which is um, from the ground, you might use a mallet to sound it. You might use a probe to see if the cavity, how you know deep the cavity is, but you're on the ground and you're not doing anything invasive. And the advanced level would be um, if you have to get somebody up in the tree to inspect it, you're using a drill or some sort of decay detecting um, device. If you're doing soil samples, lab samples, something like that. So let's look at this, this idea of what a risky tree is. Is, is this a risky tree? Well, you're like, well, that, that poor thing is in pitiful condition. There's no question about that. That tree's got, is mostly decay. It's um, um, a cherry tree on the mall and um, around the, the capital of our nation. And it's very, very old historic tree. So um, yeah, it's in pitiful condition. The health is poor, but that does not mean it's a risk. And the reason is because very unlikely if it fell, it would hurt anything. How about this one? Well, we see that that's fallen and it's starting to it's starting to hurt this fence. We don't know what's on the other side of the fence um, or if what the potential or how far that is or will that tree come through? Um, but yeah, there was a target there. So yeah, it, it, is, it is certainly gotta be dealt with and is risky. What about this one? This was a, a, um, a pretty decayed tree it had to come down and right there, you know, you see a target, there is a building, but this is the Lockwood of U of M. So at any given point in the day, there may be not today, but in, in times um, to, you know, of your incoming soon, I hope um, there'd be hundreds of students under that tree at any given time, um, probably park, you know, benches for them to sit at under there, as well as an historic building that's got, you know, what copper gutters and tile roofs and slate bathing and all that good stuff. Lots of targets. Is this a hazard? How risky is this? Well, you go, ooh, that tree, you know, that tree's failed. It's actually broken. And those are, those are dangerous because they're, you know, they're sure to come down. It's caught up in some other trees, but look at the target. Well, there's some people walking under it. And if you've gone hiking much, I'm sure you've gone under some spring trees or, or trees like this that have failed at some point. Um, what is the likelihood that a person would be under that tree when it let go. Is it possible? It is possible. Is it likely? No. How not likely? That's our job to figure out. Here's another one. I got, no, that's bad. That's a top of a, a big white pine. You can see that. I don't know if it's caught up in something. I don't know what's underneath it. I just know there's a major defect. How about that one? Is it hazardous? <laughs> Every time I show this, the climbers go, yeah, maybe to him. <laughs> you know? So um, just because a tree has a big defect does not mean necessarily that it's uh, gonna fail. So we also have to uh, assess the likelihood that it is going to fail. How about this tree? This is the, the national champion black oak in Algonac. Um, who is there first, the school or the tree? Well, we know that the tree was, it's an enormous tree. This is, this is my friend and colleague, Jim Felgenauer, who's six, I think he's six, five. So he's a big guy, that's a big tree. But also notice how close the school walls are to this tree, they're close. And oh, there's a big defect, gee whiz, that defect was, was well going when there was uh, in the day when we put concrete in cavities. That's been there a long time. 
So we had the, um, it was, it didn't turn out well, but we, we were doing a special kind of a volunteer project to um, highlight the tree and help the tree. And of course, the more we looked at it, and I mean, you can just see, I'm thinking that a lot of you can look at that and go, wow, how many roots did they cut when they put in that building? Yeah, that would that is a certain um, question. Now, obviously the tree hasn't failed yet. So did they cut so many to destabilize it? Not at the time, but don't forget all those cut roots are gonna decay. Root decay can go very, very slowly, but can be in very, in very hard to detect. So, and of course, root rots often move into the buttress and then we have whole tree failure. That could be a disaster around a school. So sometimes we, we really got to get up there and there was um, this crotch, you can see it's a multiple lead black oak, lots of um, big cuts on it from branches that were dying back. That's one reason we got the call. And sometimes you got to get up in there and uh, there's a resistor graph and the arborist um, hand up there, and we're going to do some testing up top as well as um, look at the bottom. But the whole point of this is target, target, target. How close is the target to the potential failure? What could be damaged, and how badly would the damage? You know, how badly would it injure something? How devastating would the injury be? And then how often is the target underneath that in the target zone or in the strike zone where they're going to get hurt? So remember, no target, no risk, no harm, no foul. So when we're doing risk assessment, we're going to do it systematically. And you, by all means, use the form. I, you, the um, track form is online all over the place. You can even fill, there's fillable ones. So you can get it as a PDF that you can fill, which is great. And if you don't like that one, I, I didn't want to have any issue using the old ISA hazard tree form just, to, just to, to, to get you to look at everything. So let's look at site history. What's the importance there? Well, of course, if a construction occurred near a tree, the root zone could be really devastated. Um, or the same thing with a grade change, trenching in the root zone, um, sidewalk replacement, failure of nearby trees at the base. Now, what's that mean? Well, what could be going on in that soil? Decay fungi for the, for the um, roots in the butt, the buttress of the tree. And then a change in wind exposure is huge on oh, exposure. So let's look at some of these things. Now that tree, that's a leaner. That I could tell you, um, cause I drove by that tree on a regular basis and you can see it's, it's not well uh, righted. That tree is in process of failing, but what, what happened there? You, this isn't the same tree, but it's the exact same thing happened to it. I got over there and all the roots were cut from the walk. So um, no mystery there and no, nothing to do but to, to, since there are so many targets, nothing to do but take it out. They, you know, a tree can't, can't replace that. When it starts to lean like that, it's done. Here is a, this is Ganoderma. It's one of the very most common of root rots. And uh, insidious, you know, it's hard to find unless it's fruiting and that's here and there and sometimes and sometimes not. But um, this was actually on an, uh, a tree of the same species of the tree that I was concerned with and it was not too far away. So I'm like, well, well there's, it's definitely in the area. It normally is anyway, but it also, um, you know, these were definitely well within root grafting area of each other. So it would be reasonable to expect the old oak I was looking at would have the start, at least to start again in derma. What about this tree? Well, you can see it's an oak, or maybe you can't see that, but you can see it's dying back. It's pretty thin. It's got, you know, pretty, you know, tufty growth up there and a fair amount of dead wood. And you're like, well, I can see a building behind it and all that stuff. Um, it's got good color, not some chlorosis on the left there. So you're, you're thinking, well, not sure about this tree, but if you know the site history, this is the, the oak that was moved um, down the street around the Ross engineering school that they just, they put up at U of I guess it was, I don't know, six, five, five or to seven years ago now, enough, enough years. And of course, look at the target. <laughs> so what they did is they moved this massive over 50 inch oak um, which is a phenomenal feat. I, 
I did not expect it to live as long as it has. But the target is a large glass covered pavilion um, with a brand new beautiful school and, and everybody that likes to sit under there. So um, you've looked at the site, now let's consider the tree. So one thing is you gotta know what kind of tree you have and, and know a little bit about the species. And you can, you, can, you can get online, you can ask some folks that, uh, you know, mentors or, you know, uh, people that you know that are in the biz, but we gotta know what their normal growth habits are so we understand when they're not growing normally. Their normal structural and form, uh, their typical modes of failure. And I'll bet you, you're like, oh yeah, the willow and, you know, and <laughs> the linden and some of these that are very uh, quick to fail. Level of decay resistance. How, how's good a silver maple compared to a sugar maple? And then typical signs of decay, because decay is one of our biggest um, ca um, cause of defects and result of defects, actually. So no please in this, that health and structure are not the same and may not be related. So this is very common mistake that folks make. They cannot understand why you wanna take out a tree that's green and growing like crazy. But the worst combination is to have a super healthy tree, huge crown on it and some major structural defect that's, that is compromising its integrity. That is the worst combination. Ashley, are there any questions yet? Let me ask. Nothing yet. Hmm. Maybe everybody's not awake or it's super clear. I don't know. All right, here's a species profile. We also have a species failure index uh, profile out there. This just gives you an idea um, um, of, and this is an Ohio one, but there is a national species failure profile as well. So you, you, if you know anything about box elder, you know that they have a very high frequency of failure. They rarely get really big as they fall. They here in the United, in the um, in Michigan anyway, because they fail. Norway maple moderate, um, red maple moderate, and of course, and if you get to um, silver maple, it's 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 I'm going to say high because that's that's my been in my experience. And then of course the sugar maple is low. So not all maples are created equal when it comes to failure potential. So um, the reason we're so concerned with defects is because anything ab about the tree that reduces its ability to withstand forces it, it encounters is gonna cause you problems. These could be root issues, poor structure, cracks, weak unions, decay. We're gonna look at all this stuff, but I want you to keep in mind that all the forces that are going on in the canopy of the tree and all around the tree all have to be moved through the tree, through the wood, through the trunk, down into the root system and, dis and um, to be, um, <clears throat> uh, just, um, gosh, grounded in the ground. So all that, that motion, all that that is not buffered up there or dampened by the mo movement of the tree, all that motion, all that weight, all that stuff's got to come down and be grounded. And anything on the way that is in displaces or in the way of that energy moving down the trunk is a defect that can cause structural, you know, structural issues. So let's look at root issues. This is a happy photo. One of my favorites from Ann Arbor, that's one of my coworkers who, who was really on the ball today because that was contractors who had just taken a sawzall to that buttress of that tree and cut off every single root of it. Not a large tree, but really what hope does it have there in that extension now that it's lost all its, <laughs> all its roots on one side and of course, you know, opposite the street and of course the sidewalk there. And it was all called a sack. Lots of kids were out there every day. And uh, when I explained how the tree would have to come down and they would have to pay for it, the gentleman behind my friend there <laughs> ran at me to punch me. So, um, not always a fun job, but an important job. But root issues are important. So um, this is decay. And we often see trees tipped over that, unless it's extremely uh, wet, saturated soils where even an excellent root zone cannot, doesn't have the, the um, friction to hold on because of the wet soils or extreme winds, um, you know, this is how we see them. There's just not much there and there's hardly any, any roots on it. And that's because they've been decayed. 
this is our malaria on the top there with the honey, the honey mushrooms, which I guess are good to eat, but I'm, I'm not uh, that motivated to, to, to know which ones are good and which are not. But I understand that, um, you know, they're, they, I do know that they are uh, root rot and you can see on the base of that trunk how, how flared out and fat it is. Looks like an elephant foot there. That's because that is the uh, wood it response wood that's formed because it's losing structure there. And it's, it's the forces are, um, that, are exert, that are being exerted are exceeding what it can handle. So it's, it builds wood. It's like building muscle around it. So we always look for that. Here's a root issue just because, um, well, not only is it kind of, kind of crowded there, it's mechanical, keeps getting hit, keeps getting hit. And then that makes decay, right? So we open up a wound. Here's girdling roots. This is, I like this picture because um, first of all, it's a, it's a bigger size tree that has not yet completely died, which, which we see a fair amount of time. They don't always get this big. You can see just incredibly restic restricted um, ability to, to, to expand because of the girdling roots. You also notice, the, here's my little arrow. I hope you can see it. The crack here, you see this a lot. And people have always said, well, what is, you know, is that frost crack or, you know, what is that? Well, no, it's not. Um, when I started seeing it on bigger trees like this, it dawned on me, no, no, that tree cannot flex it. It doesn't have a flare and it cannot distribute that energy flying through there and the weight, right? And the different forces, the, the compression and the, the tension and all that along that flare. So it, it's, it's a sheer plane crack. From, from being pinned in the ground and the wood is too compressed and too under too much pressure and, and um, tension from uh, the lack of ability to, to flex. Ooh, um, talk about root problems. Well, this is a, this is, I call this a poor structure problem. It's not the tree's fault. There's no room for enough roots to support a canopy like that. So um, I know a lot of places plant trees in very narrow areas. I understand why they do it, but when you plant a shade tree in a very narrow area, it's it's sort of a it's sort of um, uh, a problem that's going to happen in the future unless the tree just dies. So um, let's look at some of these other types of poor structure, all kinds of ways that trees grow for whatever reasons they do that make them not as structurally intact. This is uh, two branches. Maybe you can see that there's a seam here. They're actually starting to, um, oh my gosh, and I can't remember the word, grow together. And you see that a fair, you know, in lots of different ways. What's the problem with this? Well, I don't think it's going to affect the cambium movement and all that, especially if they completely um, graft. But what it is doing is you've got, now you've got two limbs doing their own movement, but they're restricted in, the, in their ability to dampen. It's important that branches move because that, that dispels some of that energy that's coming down in the tree. And if you can't dispel that energy, it goes into the trunk and, and at that junction, this very, um, it, it's strong, like our, but think of it like your knee. I mean, it's a very strong, good joint here, but it's it's still limited. Um, it's one of the more limited spots on the tree. So when you have all that uh, undispelled energy running down the tree, it could be too much for it. Um, yeah, and, and I, I, these things, this fascinates me also when you think about cabling and bracing, because when sometimes when we put in a non-flexing point or not flexing enough, it's not, maybe not non-flexing, but it's, it's restricting the flexing, you can get a break. That's one reason why um, there aren't like super defined places to put, you know, there's, there's if you read the ANSI standard for, for cable embracing, there's, there's certainly requirements for the kind of hardware you're gonna use and, and, some, and some, you know, places to put it in the canopy, but nothing specific because it's, it's gotta be a judgment. Uh, and my gosh, are we going to cause a, a point of um, where um, the strain is just not going to be uh, dispelled enough and it could be a potential failure point. And, uh, you know, it's been seen. We actually had one, just one at Owen that um, 
I can recall seeing we we cabled it. Big storm, you know, a good storm came through. Thankfully, the cable kept the branch from crashing into the house, but it did fail. Where it may not have if we'd not cabled it. Okay, so this is a really common thing in in our uh, open grown trees. Why? Well, because. Um, trees are often grown in forests, right? So think about a, a sugar maple and the maples are just awful at making codominant stems like this, but that's because they're grown in the open. If they were grown in the woods, they'd be, they, you know, they'd be long, lean and narrow and shoom up, you know, trying to get to the sun and they would lose all those lower limbs because of uh, the shade. But that, that, that uh, one leaf would really almost always remain because it, it's such a fight to get to the top. So it's gonna, it's gonna have a lot of, um, um, it's not going to have a lot of spread in the canopy, which is a beautiful thing to look at. We love those big open canopies, but then we're gonna often deal with these competing leads or co-dominance, poor structure. This is poor structure. So it's not that the tree, you know, it, 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 it's this poor, this poor tree has got a lot of issues, but um, anything that not just a bike, but anything that's up there that's, that's in the way of the movement of the energy or, or, um, through that trunk is going to be a problem. What else could do that? How about that little cavity? The cavity can do it. Um, this is a codominant. Blue spruce don't see that too often. And boy, that, that's a bummer. So I saw this and I'm like, well, that's a lean. It's leaning. It's not leaning a lot, but I don't, I don't love it. Um, Looks like it's been there a while and so I thought, oh, I'll look at it and the crew wasn't worried about it at all. But when I got a better look at it, it's a crack there right at the where the codominants are coming. So I'm um, not sure the lean was such the problem is the fact that it's actually in failure. So that's two sides of it. So whenever you have a crack coming from a codom or multiple leads and you go 180 and there's another one, well, obviously it's in failure. Now, can it stay that way for a while? Yeah, it can. It really can. It can. Uh, and I'm not going to bet my experience and knowledge and ability to, to decide, ooh, how long is that going to be before that finally gives way? That is actually in the process of failure. It could take, could take years. It, it could take a long time. It could be any time. So let's look at more cracks. Is this one a big, big issue? Well, it could be. What would make you know us think that? That looks like a pretty deep crack. That's of course a frost crack. It's on a looks like a London plane, and they do this when it gets to a certain temperature because the wood um, um, is not made for that low a temperature, and it and it and it cracks. So they you will see the ribs of. Uh, wound wood coming over them all the time and they may open up some years some years they don't they could be very shallow cracks they could be deeper cracks so depending upon the depth of the crack um, and the you know the size of the tree and the wood the load on the tree and if it's got a lean and all these other could decay cavities whatever all these other other factors this may not be a problem at all what about this one this is a sheer crack sheer cracks happen when in this case, the, the branch, picture this is one branch. When there's a big, heavy snow load, the branches are weighted. The, the cells on top, the wood on top is under tension. It's getting pulled apart because it's getting stretched. The cells on the bottom are under compression. It's getting smashed together because the weight of it's pushing down on it. Now, the very outside layer of the cells are the most under tension or compression. And at the level, at, in less and less and less as it goes in. So where there is the neutral plane, where there is no longer compressed cells or ten, cells under tension, it, it pops. That's a shear plane, that's a shear crack. That's the plane, it cracks along in that plane. So that's what that is. So that, that would fail, but could it, could it repair? This one, I don't, I'd say not just because all the damage on the top of it and everything. But you often see old cracked limbs up there like this that, that could have enough um, response wood around it that it looks, you know, it's healthy and it has um, accommodated um, 
or is able to accommodate the stresses that it's going to have. So this could be a problem, you know, and um, this is what we look for. I, I think people don't look for these quite, this one's very obvious, but they could just be cracked and not split apart. And those cracked limbs, depending on what, where they are, what's underneath them, how, what the loads are on them, they should maybe need to come out after, um, you know, after, after they crack, after a heavy snow load or ice or whatever. So keep that, in, you know, watch for those crack, cracked limbs. Here's a, here's not a crack. What is this? It's, it, well, there's cracks there, but this is a big cavity. So it's in the main stem of the tree. And you can see, I hope on your, that it's the wound wood is starting to roll around, right? That's wound wood. And eventually if the tree was vigorous enough and lived, could live long enough and could grow fast enough, the, the shell of new wood would grow around that. Probably this tree will not be able to grow enough wood to keep up with the amount of decay that's going on. That's a massive amount of decay. You can tell there's a lot in there, but there's, this isn't about decay. What's with the crack? Horizontal cracks are failure. They're not, the, the vertical cracks may or may not be failure mode. Well, they failed, but they may not be disastrous. Horizontal cracks, when, when wood breaks that way, it has failed, period. So horizontal cracks are very important to look for, especially on wound wood. So a tree you, I'm sure you have seen, it could be pretty good and hollow. If it's got a good enough shell around it and the wound wood is, is, is adequate, it can stay there a long time. But once you see that the wound, especially if a wound wood is cracking, and this one's cracking in multiple places, all up and down it, that shows you that wound wood is flexing more under the strains that it's experiencing than it can do. So that, that tree, that's not an imminent failure. It's a very, very likely failure. Maybe it's not, that portion has already failed. Just depends on what's going on up top. I see a house in the background. I'm going to guess a driveway, a street, and a walk nearby. That tree is, is in bad shape uh, structurally. Uh, weak unions. This is a weak union, um, but it's also a crack. What got my attention was this nice plane crack that's going along up here. And it's doing that because of this crazy bend. And while it's doing that crazy bend, because this doesn't look like it, this is right on top of it. These, these, these are like trees that are like this. And they're, it's, so it's forced this one to grow in a funny way, which it's not physically strong enough to handle for whatever reason. Notice it's, it's twisted too. You got, we've got this crack and then there's one here as well. So sometimes winter conditions good for or, uh, early spring or whatever for, for seeing those sorts of defects. This is a weak union. We, I think we're all familiar with these. I think this, I think the Zelkova pair, Linden, they all do this uh, just jam full. And notice all the interesting, now we know these are stress cracks, right? So there must've been some weight on this, probably could be the weight of the foliage at this point. Sometimes fruit will do this. And then, you know, out they, they give. Um, the co-dominant stem, depending on what it's on, can be disastrous. This is a large, large silver maple. So each one of those trunks is a massive tree itself. And we can see that there is, we want to see excluded bark and lots of it, do we not? So we know that the, each stem has room to grow still and there's no, not as much pressure between them. Well, eventually, if they live long enough, they're going to be, there's going to be a lot of pressure at that union. This one has got included bark, no question about it. Very tight seam for a long portion of the trunk. It's got what the start of what we call an elephant ear, which is the re response would growing up around that, that union right where it's joined to help support it. And of course, response wood is just like your muscle. If you're using it and you're putting force on it, it, it grows. And don't forget, trees are a perfect, perfect representation of the forces they experienced at that time. And just layer and layer and layer upon that perfect representation um, laid out in wood. Um, so yeah, this would be highly suspect of failure at some point. 
So this is a weak union, but it's also, oh my God, it's look at the decay. Do you love it? When you've got a union area that's bigger than the trunk below it, you, you definitely don't have good flow of force through in, in the trunk. You're going to have a lot of strain there. And you can see that, well, you know, there's a lot of strain because of all the wood that's grown there. So, and of course, now we have all that strain and then, and then we, and then we have decay, which often happens right there. So these two things together can really devastate a tree. So let's talk about decay. Now decay is a progress. This is, this is from the US Forest Service. Great, big, great um, visual, uh, thoroughly detailed explanation about CODIT. And um, gosh, it was, came from the lab that Shigo worked in, in in Shigo's day. So the thing about decay is it starts out, it doesn't start out with these large things we're familiar with like borers and, and um, the, the centipedes and the roly poly things and, and whatnot. When you flip over a decayed log and all that stuff crawls out, that's not where it starts. It starts with microorganisms, um, usually fungi, but also bacteria. So fungi get in there first, but it's not like, oh, it's just every fungi. No, 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 no. There are, there is years worth of, okay, this one, you know, this fungus can get in and it starts to decay the wood to a point. It, it takes apart the wood, gets its energy, does its thing. And that's as far as it goes. Well, between its byproducts and what's left in the wood, then more, fun, let's say fungi and bacteria come in. They break it down to a certain point then more things come in. So it's a long, long process. And I, anybody that's tried to, you know, get rid of a stump knows this, you know, or through, at least through decay. This stump could be really decayed. It's still gonna be there forever in a day because it's, it takes a long time. This is a very long process. It does not take so long to make the, the wood compromise structurally. It takes a very long time to make it go away completely. But um, to cause structural damage to wood doesn't take as long. But it's going to be done mostly by uh, fungi in this process. And then, of course, our job is to say, okay, well, there's, you know, all trees that of any size have decay. It's kind of a natural uh, uh, occurrence over a lifetime of a tree. You're going to have it. Our job is to go, how, is this affecting its structural integrity and how, how badly? So... Um, this is just a little coded slide as a, a reminder um, that, that all the new layers of wood that come on the tree can, can, and some of these older layers that are in there can compartmentalize the decay and keep it from moving throughout the tree. The most important thing we have to remember is that a rod is no more strong than a tube as long as there is adequate shell for the material. So this is the engineering principles they use around trying to trying to, to quantify, okay, the, the tree's hollow, is it too hollow? And how can we tell? So we're gonna use a lot of visual cues. We're gonna try to read the tree and see if it's producing a lot of response wood, if it's cracked in certain places, if it looks like, um, uh, if it's shifting on its base, if there's, if there's decay fungi, whatever, we're going to look and look and look as well as looking at how much and how consistent is the shell around this decayed portion. So this is, this is ideal, right? It's right down the center and you can see there's some decayed wood. That is the brown colored area here on that bottom photo. And this, all this fresh wood, brand new wood, wall four laid on over it. So um, engineering formulas are, you know, they're trees aren't, trees aren't rods and posts and poles and lumber. They are growing living things and dynamics. So rarely do we find a decay column that's the central. Oftentimes they're associated with the wound and they're off to that side. Like this one on the picture above. It's more decayed where the wound occurred. And that's off center. So then all our formula, you know, all those engineering formulas, they're just, they're just a start to the process. So when, when we have decay, it often happens at a, an old branch wound, oftentimes pruning wounds, 
Sometimes they rip out. Um, oftentimes when branches are shed, they're not, they should not have decay behind them unless a tree is in, in not in greatest condition or has some big decay column because they're made to shed and they have all that great wound wood that comes around, helps close it off and the tree grows over it and moves on. Well, when they lose big branches or if, if the cambium's disrupted somehow and the wound wood can't form like up here, then, then you can really get decay. But this wound wood, the only issue I would have with this one is that it's not formed up here. It looks like it's got a canker up there. So as the energy is coming around this tree, it is, it is going to be condensed around that wound because all the energy that would come normally get dispelled through the middle of that tree, it can't. There's a hollow there now. So it has to rush around the sides. That's how uh, the energy is dispelled. Uh, dissipated, move through. And when you have a, um, any kind of defect, even, even if it's, you know, well suited, if it's, if that wound wood isn't complete, then, then, then you've got more strain. So that's, that's a potential area of, of extra strain that, that we don't want to see. Um, so ind indicators of decay, fruiting bodies are huge indicators of decay. Now the fruiting bodies, are, they're fascinating, of course. I mean, that is really something. And, uh, but you know what, how long is that gonna be on the tree there? Could, could be, you know, if you leave it to its own and you don't pull, pull a lot of people, you know, if there's a gardener or whatever, they're, and that's on the ground, they're gonna pull that off and, you know, put it in the mulch or rake it up or whatever. So on the, on the trunk like this, you'd think, well, God, that should be there forever. Well, no, that's actually a living thing that's, that's producing spores. When it's done doing its thing, it kind of shrivels up and kind of disappears. You, 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 sometimes they're hard to see. Well, they're very hard to see a lot of the time. Um, but even when they're, you know, they're, they formed relatively, um, you know, uh, recently, it sometimes they're hard to see. I love this. These, these bay, this, these butt or basil or buttress, um, Decay patches are a real issue. And I think that anybody knows this because you just sense it. Well, first of all, that means the whole tree is going to fail. When it goes, it's going there at the base. And that's, that's our worst case scenario. It's not a limb dropping. It's the whole tree. And <laughs> I, um, you never know what you're going to find in some of these. I drilled into a tree. That, oh, it's a great tree, too. I had no idea there was it's a big black oak. I had no idea there was decay in it. It it looked perfect, but I drilled into it because of the tar the the sensitivity of the tar the target and the owner and the, and the owner's concern. And I hit concrete, so it's like boy, you you just never know. But um, yeah, this is this is not um, this this is certainly an indicator of decay and a really old decay because so I'm hoping people aren't doing this anymore, but probably very old treatment there. But when you see this, you're going to, you know, there's a root rot associated with it. it's got to be. Oh, that's our worst case scenario. Failure. But notice how much was gone in this tree. Very thin shell on that tree. That could have been a predictable failure, possibly. So when we're detecting decay, the first things, this is, um, seems obvious, but um, even with tools or, or whatever you're using, uh, some people, I think they feel like if they have a resisted graph or drill or some kind of tool that they, you know, oh my God, it just, it takes all the work out of it. It's easy. It's not because it's your eye, your experience and your ability to read the tree's defects that are going to, um, determine, um, or help you to decide, you know, if the tree is defective or, um, structurally unsound and if you need to take further action to see how unsound it is. So before you get into too much, boy, you really got to look at it and look at it thoroughly. Now that's not always so obvious. So decay can be, can be really, really obvious, but it's not usually quite this obvious. And I love how, you know, this guy, probably somebody condemned it 10 years before and there it's still standing because it has, you know, very, it's it, whatever it's doing on the top, it's managing to hold it up there on the trunk. Um, so what's the first thing you would do with this? Well, cavities, again, are a real issue because we know, first of all, the tree's got a lot of decay in the center. 
Now, as I said, the cent just because it's decayed in the center does not mean that it's structurally unsound. But we also have a very large defect in the trunk that that energy has to move around. So first thing, it, you know, and I think everybody would, would see this, you're going to want to really look and see the extent of that decay, the thickness of the shell around it. And if there's any evidence of failure in this wound wood or the wood around it, any cracks, horizontal cracks, um, or excessive buildup of um, response wood around it. The showing is still getting a lot, you know, too much movement there. Um, once you, you know, once you give it a really good look over and um, you can, you can sound it. So um, this is just basically, you know, telling us that the sound waves aren't traveling quite as fast through the decayed wood as they are the, the sound wood. And we can hear that. Um, if I like a little neoprene hammer, it's a little more, um, gives it a little more pop to it. So I can hear that better. But, you know, people don't always, you know, you can't always count on it because I have sounded stuff and I thought, well, that doesn't sound right. But then better safe than sorry. So then I went ahead and, and, and did an invasive test on it. I drilled it and, and, and it was okay. But um, it is yet another tool. And this is one way, this is the cheap man's resistor graph. What you can do is um, put a, Put a foam ear plug on the tip of that very, use the smallest drill that you can get because we know we don't want to punch big holes in trees. We hate to punch any holes in trees, especially when we think they're decayed because if you're, as you're drilling through, you could be going through wall four and right into the decayed area and bringing that decay back into wall four and causing decay. We only do this when the stakes are high. We really need to know if this tree is a potential, um, if this needs to be removed rather than just a potential remover. So um, you stick the, you stick the ear foam at the, at the tip of the drill bit. And as the drill bit goes in, first of all, you're going to see the wood shavings and they should be nice and white. If you, if you had a very long drill bit and you got into hardwood, that might be a little discolored, but typically we're not going that deep. And if it's white, then it, then you may actually feel a hollow or you may see a uh, discolored dark wood or uh, soft or wet. And meantime, when you see that and you come back out, your, your little earplug has been moved down the drill bit and that can tell you the thickness of the good wood. So it's that length minus the bark, of course, the width, the, the, um, the width of the bark. And that's how much good wood you have. But you can also, if you have a resistor graph or something like it, um, they, oh, they got great models now, but this is an old timer. This is, <laughs> this is what we use, um, but it's uh, basically a very high speed, very, very narrow bit, very long bit. And it, as it goes through the wood, okay, you know, it builds resistance on the tip, whoops, on the tip of that um, drill bit. And it should climb slowly over time and just keep climbing. And that would be completely sound wood. If it's, it's gonna do this at first with the bark and do a little something goofy. And then if it goes like this one did and then it starts dropping, well, that shows you that the, the wood is compromised. And if it just goes flat, it's hollow. So you can see this, you say, well, that tree looks solid. Well, it is, it's, but it is very much decayed. This is not, this brown area is not all heartwood. That is not heartwood, that's decayed wood. And that decayed wood, has less resistance to it. So even though it's still there, this is not a hollow tree. It does not mean that that tree is structurally sound. But the fact that we removed it and, and I had drilled it and all that, or uh, this person did or whoever, shows that there was something um, most likely visually show, telling you that there's something, something's not quite structurally right about the tree. Hey, Kay, one quick question. Sure. Would you explain what C-O-D-I-T stands for? Oh, yeah. Let's talk about code it. Compartmentalization of decay in trees. Where's the code it? Um, so, okay. Code it. C-O-D-I-T. 
compartmentalization of decay in trees. This is the model that Alex Shago put together decades ago because he had he was a, a US Forest Service guy and he he dissected hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of trees to see how they decayed and what it looked like. So you see the little diagram on this page. It shows like they literally cut trees down and looked at in many, 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 many slices and put them together in 3D so they could see the decay columns and what they were doing. He also injured trees to see how the wound would, would form, what the wound wound was made out of what in callus and what that looked like. And um, which, you know, and they tried different types of decay and different types of trees. So he and his team and others there really, really learned about how trees to decay. So this is how we learned from back in the day when we learned to flush cut a tree. So taking off the limb, flush to the trunk so that you are cutting into the trunk. We don't do that anymore. We know that that removes um, all of the, the branch tissue and into the trunk tissue where that um, reaction zone is and that um, protective zone is and the cambium that is gonna form the wound wood. So this is how this was all learned. So if you are pruning, uh, I hope you are cutting at the collar, right? Because the collar is where the branch joins the trunk. We don't wanna cut into that because that's where they're, they overlap and that's where that protective zone is. So all part of that um, is the different, it's, it's complex, there's four walls, three of which are already on the tree. Here they show you, um, there is a natural barrier between annual rings, it's wall two, that prevents decay from moving inward. There's a, nat there's a natural barrier at the rays, which is three, these, because there's, um, you know, the tree makes chemicals and it's got some physical barriers to the movement of decay there as well. Wall one is up and down the tree. Um, and that's just the xylem cells and how they're formed. And then, so all those walls are already there and doing their thing. And it goes from one is the weakest, the annual rings is the second weakest, or uh, the rays are the third, week, third strongest, I should say. And the fourth wall is the most strong. And that wall is reaction wood when you wound a tree and then this special very, um, it's, not as, it's not as good in strength, but it has all the microbial um, chemicals to, to, to kill antimicrobials in it. So that it's very hard for decay to get through wall four. So that's why you often get these hollows like showing here where it did not go through wall four, but it certainly went through wall one because it's all up and down in that tree. Went through wall two because it went right to the, you know, to the hollow. Um, and wall three, because you don't have um, the pie-shaped decayed area like that, that you forms between rays. Um, Ashley, ask if that person's, oh, you know, is that enough? Okay. I think that took care of the question though. All right. Well, look it up because it's, it's quite fascinating and super helpful because once you see, the important thing is once you see decay, you, you this, if you understand, you know, okay, it's going to go up and down the most, it's going to go in easier. It's going to, then it's going to get blocked, you know, circumferentially more. And it, and it does not want to go, you know, it's, it's really shouldn't be going through wall four. So if you can see, if you understand all that, and then as you're looking at decay patterns, you can see how advanced that decay is and what the chance a tree has to, to overcome it. It's really important. All righty. Um, all right. So yes. So again, discolored wood does not mean it's structurally um, okay. And I know a lot of arborists that mistake this. They, the, the wood's still there. It's hard. And sometimes it's, it's got awful hard to get the saw through because it does change chemically. So it can be that really spongy white rod. It can be, it can be very brittle and very hard to get a saw through. And they're like, that wood's fine. It's not fine. It's not structurally had the strength that it, that um, the tree needs and is used to. All right, let's talk about mitigating the risk. So we're gonna go assess all this risk. If you're using the track system or any other, you should be able to say, oh, this is an, this, this is an imminent failure. You've got to deal with it today. And then rank them maybe prior, you know, priority one removal of trim, priority two, priority three. 
that would be our job to um, kind of kind of not quantify, but qualify the risk. So we can't put a number on it because, you know, tree number, the, you know, if you put like, oh, this is a, this is a number five and that's a number four. And you went between properties and all that and on different species, it wouldn't be the same. So you, you're not going to put a number to it. You, you rank it that way. You're going to rank it qualitatively. Bad, really bad, not too bad. Okay. So the target. So again, um, we, you know, we get really focused on the tree, which is exactly what you'd expect from a bunch of arborists. That's what you're going to do, but don't forget the target. So I love this picture in the backyard because now they're on a wood edge there. And um, there is a fence underneath that tree that got smushed, but notice all the stuff, all the play equipment is away from it. So if they decided to put the play equipment underneath the shade of that wood edge, then, they, then they'd have a different story. This is the Y Oak. Um, it, it's, the, it's in Connecticut. Oh, was I lucky to see it? It's a magnificent tree. I think it, they used to, this is in Connecticut and they used to muster under it um, in the Revolutionary War. This is how important this tree is. Notice the fence around it. So for many, 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 many hundreds of years, people were allowed up under this tree. And when I saw it, as part of an ISA conference, I was horrified because the it was so compacted, you know, and this thing used to be part of a farm. Obviously now there's roads around it and neighborhoods and everything like that. And they had people all over the, the root system. I thought she's between, you know, cutting the road. And I'm sure that house, in fact, I know that was an original house back there, that little one, but we can, we can rest assured the one on the left was not. And that little one, I think, has electricity now and, and water and gas and all that good stuff um, that's under the ground. So there's all kinds of things going on with the root zone. But this bad boy had miles of cable in it. Miles. I kid you not. And um, I think it, I'm going to guess, but you can look it up. But I think it was 86, 90 cables, something like that. It was incredible. However, it all started to die back. This is a pretty early picture and all that, but they at least fenced it off because of course it fell in a storm at one point and you can see how big this was and what a disaster it would be. And wasn't, weren't we lucky it didn't go for the house. So whenever we can remove the target. Okay, let's uh, prevent issues too, if we can. Now this, uh, this is still one of my pet, eaves of oh god of our world because landscapers grow nurserymen grow trees beautifully these things are ready to go and then we put them in the ground or we don't straighten the root systems and they they die of girdling roots and they're planted too deep over and over and over and over i've been watching it my entire career so um again here's the stress that those those cracks that the tree's getting because it's flexing and it has absolutely no way to move it has no flare there's no way to dispel that energy. So a lot of these trees just pop out of the ground. But if they do get to a good size, um, they, they can fail as well. So this so is you, obviously a small tree, but yeah. Can you identify response wood visually? Um, yeah, let me see. Um, response wood is, is flare wood right here. So when a flare is, is formed, that wood is put on. It's not a straight stick. It's put on because this is where trunk is meeting ground. And that's where an awful lot of strain and force is going through here, where, where um, the energy is moving from the trunk and the out up here up on the air and into the ground. So that's where you get a flare. So think of it also as, let's see. Um, you're always going to see response wood underneath large limbs because, here's a good one, because this is where the energy is coming down from the tree and joining the trunk and there's a lot of strain there. So the, the, the tree puts more wood on. Every year it feels a strain, it puts muscle on. Every year it feels strain, it puts muscle on. And that's how whenever you see those bulges or um, big ribs around cracks or something that's the wood getting laid on by the tree every single year or two in response to the extra force there it's like ooh, i gotta bump it up or i'm gonna break so under all those nice flares and all those um mm, the branch 
uh, what do you call that? Underneath the branch where it's bigger. It's like it's a buttress. So it's a flare. So does that answer? I think so. I'll um, follow up. Yeah, if keep not. an eye for me. Okay, cool. All right. So yeah. So so um, if you're going to have a if you got a larger tree and you can you can correct this, it's really important. But when I mean, you cannot correct it, know that it's a big defect and it can fail at the base. I think um, young tree training is also one of our least done practices with the most value. That was certainly my experience as Ann Arbor Forester. I, I cannot tell you how many Norway maples split on us. It was every single time the wind blew a little bit or it snowed a little, those trees would break at the codominant or multiple leaded trees, right when they're getting to the size where they're really getting valuable and people you know, are really appreciating the shade and, and we're getting the stormwater benefits and all this stuff. So if you want to keep a tree for any length of time that's grown out in the open and in the landscape, if you do not prune it, and this one of course is showing you it wasn't raised and all this stuff, but if you don't prune it, you're going to have a lot of competition up in the canopy. You're going to have a lot of branches that are too close together, scaffolds and the lead. You might have multiples, you might have codominance. Those are going to break because a tree cannot put enough response wood around those junctures to, to compensate for the pressure between them and all that energy running into the same area of the trunk. You just can't do it, most trees. So young tree training is as simple as one main lead on a shade tree, one main lead, one main lead on a shade tree, that's it. And then those scaffolds should be well um, space because you don't want a lot of branches coming in around the same area on the trunk on the same node. So it should look like a spiral staircase all the way around. So there's a lot of room to be a perfectly formed, uh, uh, good looking canopy for our landscape purposes and spaced appropriately so that um, you have every chance of retaining scaffold branches for a very long time. I'm kind of tired of having trees that that die in the any more in the landscape. I think we're lucky to get a shade tree the way they plant them, and we're lucky to get one to live 35 years. I think that's pitiful, pitiful. It's sad, and much less in the city, much less. So here's um another way to mitigate risk. So let's say we have a tree that um you know they all and even if they're, you know, they're growing fine, they got one main lead, they are going to get thick and they're going to need some shedding because they're open grown. So we do do a, a crown cleaning. That means if you, you know, ANSI standard can um, refer to that as well, but that's like taking crossed branches out, competing branches out, uh, diseased branches, uh, inferior branches that are kind of dying back anyway, all good proper cuts, do it often. So what do we mean? What every 15 years or so from maturing trees, something like that, depends on the species. Get, get that stuff out of there so that nothing is ripped out in a storm um, and nothing gets to, to be too big, so big that, that when you do remove it, the, the wound can't be closed over in a, a quick time. So you're gonna do young tree training, um, probably I think about, she's three or four times, you know, what, you know, when they, in the kippy shoot, you know, it's a couple clips when they're really little, but when they're in for five years, when they're in for, after they've been in 15 years, maybe 25 years, that's it. So a couple times when they're young, then again, when they're maturing, maybe a couple times, you may not have to hit them again until they're really old. Then you might have to do some of the, and this is all part of it. So it's not training it so much. This tree doesn't need training in the sense that it does have one main lead and, and reasonable scaffolds. It just has to be, um, uh, some of the inferior branches taken out. Thinning is, is also a possibility. This is not done to uh, improve wind movement through the tree anymore. That's how I learned it back in the day. That is not how we improve wind movement and prevent breakage. That's just to get, if you've got a lot of, um, oh, like uh, Norway maples are, are ridiculously heavy, heavily branched and shaded trees. So sometimes you get a lot of inferior branches in there, which I'd almost call crown cleaning. 
But what do we do if we have branches that are overextended, they're too long and they're heavy and you're afraid they're going to break at the stem or um, uh, then maybe they don't even look good, but you've got a tree that's, that's really big and, and possibly, or maybe you have a little decay pot, you know, like a cavity or something near a crotch and you're a little concerned about that breaking out. We can mitigate that too by reducing the crown. So this should say, this is crown, uh, this is crown reduction is what I'm showing you here. So what you do is you simply make the proper cuts, which are thinning cuts, um, to, you know, to a, um, uh, another branch or stem that's at least a third of its diameter. So you're not, you know, you're not making heading cuts by any means, but you are taking that whole canopy in. Now, why would we do this? Because, thank God for research, mostly done by Ed Gilman and his group in Florida after the hurricanes, how do we storm proof trees? Let them, let them move wind through better. It's not by gutting them. You do not, this thinning is not how wind moves through trees quicker. It's not intuitive to me, but that is the truth. It's better if you shorten the limbs because that shortens the length of a lever arm. So picture this, there's a lot of force going on on the end of a branch. And the breaking point of, of any object is it's the length of the lever arm and the force on it. The longer the lever arm, right? So if you've got, you know, a crowbar that's this long and you need something this long, boy, you know the difference, right? The longer the lever arm, the, the less force is, is um, experienced at the trunk. So we reduce the lever arms, that's what we're doing. Now also for the person with the um, response wood, see all the response wood at these branch, underneath these branches, that's gravity, you know, and, and load from wind and, or uh, excuse me, from leaf load. And then uh, if they get wet or, you know, rain or snow, that's the, the muscle holding, keeping these upright. Okay, how does the tree respond to that kind of cutting? This cut would make them, so if you see the black there, it looks exactly like this tree, just smaller. It's going to grow exactly normally. That's mm -hmm. the whole point of thinning cuts, not head cuts. Thinning cuts, and as long as you don't take too much off the tree, not more than a third, and if it's a mature tree, I'd say not more than a fourth, a fifth, a sixth, maybe, depending on the kind of tree and how strained it is. It was, should grow absolutely normally. Now, let me show you, this is re natural retrenchment. This is, this all comes from, this crown cleaning comes from, uh, crown, re excuse me, crown reduction comes from retrenchment. This is something they've been doing in Europe forever and we're just sort of looking into. This is a, an oak tree, I don't know where it is, um, that is naturally shrinking down to a smaller tree. So if we could draw a red line around that and all that dead wood was out of there, we go, oh, well, that's a, well, that's a big, fat, thick trunk for that little tree. It is. But just like uh, anything in nature, as it, when it first is growing, trees need to get to the sun. So my God, they get as many leaves up in the sky as quickly as they possibly can. That's going to lead them to a tall and very spread out tree. Leaf in the sky. That's what they need. That takes a lot of work. At some point, they cannot keep up with all the maintenance and all that wood. They can't. It's too much work for them. They're too old. They can't do it. So they naturally shrink their canopies back and they do this by busting branches off the top. They die back at the top and they break. That's how they do it. Well, we can't, we can't do that. We can't, well, we can't, but then and they can't, we can't allow them to do that in the landscape around houses and schoolyards and things like this. We can't do it. So, um, most of the time when trees get to this size in the United States and this, this kind of condition, we take them down. Well, now they're looking at it and going, well, depending on the target, can the target be moved? Can, you know, can we um, eliminate the target? What if we retrenched it? Now that retrenchment pruning is pretty, it's, it's not as delicate as this because there's not always those nice branches to take it back to. So you are going to get some head cuts and retrenchment and you're going to get some interior suckering and all that stuff. But over time, and I've seen, I saw a presentation last year from an Italian. I mean, my God, they, 
this tree was like 600 years old and they had kept it that long by this method. And it's not just like the willows at your top and it's suckers, top it and it's suckers. It's not that. It's a little different. It's never the same as the young tree, but it's certainly viable. And, um, you know, uh, a good way to mitigate risk. It's a good way to mitigate risk. So I do a, quite a lot of this on trees that have um, some sort of defect. Uh, usually it's a cavity or something ripped out in the storm or something. And I don't, we don't really want to take the tree down. We might do it in conjunction with cable embracing, you know, cabling. Um, but we do quite a lot of it. And boy, you want to, you want to upset a climber, have them get out to the tips, every tip of a very large tree. It's very expensive. It takes a lot of work, but if you, if you care about your big, big tree, um, that might be the way to do it. Might be the only way to do it. So maybe that U of M tree would be good for this sort of thing, maybe. Oh, which reminds me also, this is why we don't remove all these little interior branches. They're gonna need them later. So don't, do not gut out a tree. This isn't terrible, but you've everybody seen the lion's tail tree where there isn't a single interior branch, all the weights at the top. Bad for the lever arm problem because you got all the force at the top. There's no buffering in between and you have nothing to cut back to should you lose a tip. You have nowhere to go. The tree wants those interior branches. If they're viable, leave them alone. Of course, we can cable and brace. This is, this is um, a, the catalpa tree. It's the only remaining original tree at our Michigan Capitol. And it's, it's in miserable condition as far as its structure. So they put a big fence around it. They keep people away from it. And they put this, this uh, you know, aren't they clever? They made a light pole out of it as well. Why not? That's a good idea. So I've got this, this brace um, and cables in the top as well. So there is, this guy is, uh, is a pretty serious defect. <laughs> If you're going to cable and brace, I often tell you, uh, you're going to need to perform some pruning, pruning as well. Are you really going to need to look at that? Now, just keep in mind, I didn't do a lot of this. I didn't do any of it in the city because when you cable and brace a tree, you're, you're acknowledging it as a defect. And of course, you know, cities are not, um, they have to think, and the, the targets are huge, right? Because you've always got streets and sidewalks and houses that they're after. You can do this in your yard and you can mitigate the risk, but you do need to tell them, okay, what's the residual risk with this? Well, there's still risk to any tree that's still standing, but maybe you've taken it from high risk to medium and, and they're okay with that. That's up to the tree owner. You tell them what you can do and what the re residual risk would be and it's up to them to choose. This was a tree um, that see it was very close to the house so I wasn't worried about it crushing the house but I was definitely worried about the pool the kids the kids area the, the driveway and all that stuff this tree was it sounded hollow I drilled it it looked hollow it was not hollow but my gosh somebody said on the crew they didn't know they're like oh there's all that wood and it was hard to get through that was a awful to sell this decayed is decayed wood it is does not have the strength I showed them the tape I said look at this I know that was hard to cut because there's still a lot of lignin and it's changed a little bit, but it's not as strong. And look at the look at the little, little, little shell of good wood on this. Not usually you want a third of the radius. That would have to come into here to support that tree. How did I, you know, it was dying back pretty hard, but this, this house was built after this tree. And look how close it is. Can you imagine the root decay? Is there any roots on this side? I don't, I don't know but I would be surprised. Oops, I'm sorry, I, had, I thought I had the buttress. And if you looked at the buttress, I showed you the one that had the big fat blob. It, like this looks like it's like a, looks like a bulge, you know, where it's constricted almost at the bottom. If that's not a girdling root and, and on big, big trees, it's very rarely is. It's, it's because the wood, the response wood is putting on as much flare you know, you know, much wood at the base as it can because it's rotted below. This tree showed that. So this tree had significant root and butt rot. Okay. Can you, can you, can you yes. go back one slide? Sure. Um, well, just a question on the long-term maintenance of cable and brace trees. Yeah, excellent, excellent question. When you put it in a cable or and or a brace, you must, you don't have to do anything, but it, by ANSI standard, you have to put in an inspection period on this. Typically it's annually, 
depending on how big it is. Now, if it's a little, let's say it's a little ornamental peach or something, not a risky tree, then, then you don't necessarily have to return. But it, typically they are, we are trying to address risk. And then you put down a reinspection time. Annually is common. And then after any major storm, because you know that can, that can change things. This is the, the, the problem with this sort of thing is the owner may, of the house may change. Um, do you have the capability in your business or your organization to make sure you get back annually and check this? And does the owner that's the tree owner at that time is willing to put the money in for that? Uh, that can change too with their, um, you know, their situation. So what I would recommend is you, you put it in writing that you will, you know, it has to be, you, you're happy to do this. This is by ANSI standard. You have to reinspect it. You're calling it a year, you know, at each year, annual inspection or, or more, if you think that's important. And after every major storm event and you put it in writing and you keep it in your files. And um, if you know that, that um, you know, sometimes we know that uh, somebody else is now occupying the house, you know, I would definitely draw it to their attention. You know, we, we had this contract with the old one and the old owner and uh, about this tree. And you, you should be aware that, you know, it'd be time to inspect it, something like that. Does that answer the question? Um, I think so. If there's a follow up, I'll let you know. Also, we have 10 minutes left. Just yeah, I think we got, we got plenty of time. Whoops. Okay. Yeah. So the only thing um, for risk management, I guess the only thing I want to emphasize on this is um, if you're the risk manager now, I'm the risk assessor. I used to be the risk manager as well when I was the forester because it was my call. Of course, my boss is above me did the real call um, when someone complained or something, then it was up to them. But otherwise, if it's if it's if you're uh, a sales arborist or something, you are your job is to identify the risk, communicate very clearly what the risk you think, what level it is for the time frame. However, you want to say that. Well, I wouldn't have it over my house for another year, or let's you know let's revisit this next year. Whatever you think, and uh, in writing would be would be smart. Um, I, don't, I have no problem with a verbal report, but it is nobody will remember, including you. And um, it means nothing. It should something happen to that tree and they want to come after you or your business, then you need to have in writing what you told them and why. So um, our job is to inspect the tree using a reasonable method and visual tree assessment is your, is your baseline unless you're doing populations of trees. So if you're out there after a big storm and you're, you're going down the street of a city and, and just looking for, you know, uh, trees that must come down immediately. That's, that could be a, a, the, um, the basic assessment. Otherwise you're gonna, you're gonna have to do the, um, the ground assessment with the visual. And then, and, and you can prioritize the work. You can say, you know what, I, I think, you know, of the, of the 20 trees in your yard, I've identified three that I think really need to be pruned, you know, very soon. And the other 15 or whatever, you know, can, can wait, so let's say three year period or something. Then the, it's the tree risk managers, who is the owner of the tree or the one that's responsible for the tree. It's their job to determine what they actually want to do. And of course, it's going to be based on money. It's going to be based on, um, it could be based on time. If you have crews you're running or something, and it's your crews. And, and, and of course their opinion, their level of risk is, is really important because any of us who have talked to homeowners about a tree they're concerned about, they might say their concern might be, my God, my grandfather planted this. And it's oh, I just, I just, I mean, I really want to keep it. Well, their risk tolerance is probably going to be a lot higher than the person's like, you know, I, I, I never, I always, the tree worries me. It's always worried me. It's, it, it, it's creaks in the night. It just scares me to death. So depending on their level of tolerance, it's your job to communicate the risk and their job to decide what they want to do with it. And of course, it's, it's equally as important that you tell them how to mitigate the risk if they're interested in that. Well, of course they are, you know, they would be calling you. So uh, mitigating all the options of risk and then also uh, to let them know what the residual risk would be if they choose to re just prune the tree or cable the tree. That, that's very important as well. All right, so that's what I have. This fine day, any questions? 
Another one kind of following up with the cabling, can you explain the criteria for the inspection? Like, are you looking at the load or tension on those cables? Oh, you mean for like the, um, if you're looking at a tree and you're, oh, okay. Uh, ask them, is this for when you're going back to look at the, uh, I believe so. Hardware that is... that's already installed. You're going to look to see, first of all, if it's seeded well, because um, the, the tree's going to decay around that wound eventually. Could be a very, very long time. You know, so you're going to, first of all, look for the, for tension in the line too. It shouldn't be slack and it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be bone tight unless there's a big load on it right then. So let's say you have full leaf and you had a, a wet snow with leaf on it, or it's in leaf and it was a, um, a drizzly rain. So there's a lot of wet leaves. It could be pretty tight then, but you're going to want to check it when it's, when it's not as loaded. You don't want a ton of slack. So it would snap. You do not want them to snap. So you can't have a lot of slack there, but you can't have it so ream and tight that, that you know, they can't move. Um, so balance that little thing. And then of course you're gonna look where, as I was trying to, as I said earlier, the hardware where it's going in the trees can decay. So you wanna make sure that that's really seated well. Um, that is the biggest thing. And of course, if anything's frayed or if you can see any kind of weird um, cracking around the limb or something like that. But the number one is the tension from the ground you can see. And then when you get up there, you check, you check the decay around the hardware. Okay. Thanks. Uh, another question. Does the elephant foot like growth on the base of a trunk happen in any way outside of decay? Um, they have a large, beautiful oak that they've been watching. It looks healthy, full crown, little dieback, no conks or soft spots, but there's high value target nearby. Ask, um, ask them what species it is. And I would say, no, there's something going on there. Doesn't mean it's bad. Does it got a codominant stem in it or multiple leads? Is it really spread out? So I'm asking this because if it's, if it's got a, a big amount of response wood at the base of the tree, that is in response to some stress that is not flowing readily through the trunk into the ground. So it could be that it's a very, the, it's compensating, it's responding to this very big spread out crown. It could be uh, if they got codons, they got a lot, of, a lot more action going on below than they'd like, or I can't say it that way, but they got to respond to it. And then otherwise um, cracks, internal cracks will do it. And that might be, that's, that can be sometimes hard to see. So boy, I'd sure look at the structure of the tree above. And it is possible. No, it's, it's always gonna be within the trunk there. And it is possible depending on the size of this tree and the species that it is, it's got a severe girdling root at that site. Mm, okay. Yep, she just came it's back always something. It doesn't mean that the tree response wood is good, a good thing. That's how the trees stay up, right? Mm -hmm. That's how they deal with the things that go on in life and what they have, what they have to deal with. It's if it's if it is responding, if there's a lot of response, what doesn't mean the tree's not stable, but it does mean there's some some defect that it, that's going on. There's some condition that it's responding to, and that may be not the only way it's impacting that tree. You, and it may be that you're concerned that that um, condition is going to um, be overpowering the, the ability of the tree to respond to it. Um, do you have any sources uh, to look for for learning more about the subject? Yeah, so if I were you, um, depending on if you're a certified arborist, you know, you might want to look into track. Um, if you're not a certified arborist, I would go, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of webinars are out now. There's a lot on the web about all this stuff. So a good web search will help you. But if you want to like, uh, the tree worker program from TCIA has got, talks quite a bit about this for a climber's perspective. So somebody who's actually getting in trees and dismantling trees. And ISA, so let's see, it's, that's the track would be more for actually assessing the, the um, to assess it. And then there's a lot of books out there. I, I put up some pictures out there and those are still, they're still available. And a lot of these are good books. 
I'll show you. All right. Um, yes. So um, I think let's see. This I know a value in treaty effects is still up. This evaluation hazard trees is still is still out there. It's it's not as new as it was, of course, but it's still out there. And yeah, go, go to the ISA library. That's a good way too, unless you want to go online. Okay. Thanks, yeah. Kay. Um, I believe that's all the questions we have. Um, right, well, let me throw up the CEUs. Thank you yeah. for joining us. And I've also in the chat, I put a link to a Google form. Fingers crossed that everybody's able to access that this round um, where you can add your ISA registration number or SAF if you're looking for those credits. Um, so just be sure to submit that. Uh, thanks, Kay. Thank you, Ashley. Yeah, thanks, Kay. That was uh, that was great as usual. And also, I wanted to uh, say that these forestry network meetings are done in collaboration with ISA Michigan. So many thanks to them. And um, I believe on the survey we ask you for suggestions for next year. We're getting ready to uh, put together our speakers. Uh, series both for professional and for homeowners. So we are open to your topics and your suggested speakers. Thank you all very much and have a great Thanksgiving. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Yeah, that's good stuff. Very Did you good. Like Good comments. Okay, yeah, not a lot of questions. Hopefully, people will just uh, know it. I, know, I think um, they, I think they had opportunity to ask, so that's good. Yes, yes, I think that's one of the best things about this is is that. So, agreed. All right. Okay, well, we'll let everybody exit, and then we'll talk about our paperwork here. Yeah, details. Uh, details. We need to. And uh, oh, there we go. Um, Ashley, do you know who was asking about the um, learning more and the cabling? Um, yeah, so Mike Lattice, L-A-T-U-S, asked about um, both identifying the response wood visually and then finding more sources. Mm -hmm. um, David Green asked about the criteria for cabling inspection. Oh, okay. Okay, all right. Um, maybe what we need to do is to end this and then Ashley, you want to send out a, another real quick thing and we'll get back on again. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay.